Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a series that provides or hopes to provide hope and avenue for healing, and one that will then help you better understand and then live the great mercy of God. With me today, I have the National Executive Director of the Henry Nowlin Society and Legacy Trust, Karen Pascal. Uh, she's going to help us walk through who was Henry Nowlin. Uh, interesting, brilliant man. He was a Dutch Catholic priest, ordained in 1957. He's a professor, writer, and theologian. His interests were rooted primarily in psychology, pastoral ministry, spirituality, social justice, and community. He's written several, several books. Over the course of his life, he was influenced by such people as Rembrandt, Vincent Van Gogh, Jean Vanier. I uh, studied and spoke, actually, I, I should say, taught at inc academic institutions like Notre Dame, Yale Divinity School, Harvard. He went on to work with individuals, uh, those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I read that he was uh, kind of looking to, for a Eucharistically centered community. And he said he found it in the L'Arche Larche Daybrook community in Richmond Hill, Ontario. That's another great group. Uh, the viewers and listeners might want to look up, but um, he struggled with his sexuality, uh, but there was never any evidence that he broke his vows of celibacy, um, and we're just going to talk about Henry now and why him. Well, years ago, I read a book. Actually, the first one I think I read was Return of the Prodigal Son, and that touched me in a major way, and then another one, and we're just going back. This was printed in 1979, but The Wounded Healer, and I thought we'd just talk about the wounded healer. And um, but first, before we get into uh, Henry Nowen, uh, Karen, what's the mission really of the Henry Nowen Society and, and Legacy Trust? Well, they are two separate organizations. The Henry Nowen Society exists for both Canada and for the United States. We are uh, we are officially a charitable organization in both places, and our mission is really to share Henry now in spiritual vision so that people can be transformed by experiencing themselves as God's beloved. That was really a core vision that Henry now had that we would understand that we're beloved by God. And, and it, it weaves itself through his writings, particularly you mentioned the return of the prodigal son, but there seemed to be a, a moment of great breakthrough in his life where in a sense he received that he was God's beloved. And then it became important to share that with everyone else. The Henry Nowen Legacy Trust is actually the uh, the entity that holds the rights to all of Henry's writings. So it exists uh, really as the, that keeper of, of, of the books and of the writings and of the teachings, etc. And we are associated too with the Henry J. M. Nowen Archives and Research Center at the University of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. So there's a, an extensive archive collection that people can access if they're interested in doing research on Henry Nowen. And if you go to our website, which is henrynowen.org, we'll have all sorts of links that would link you to that and give you lots of information about the Henry Nowen Society. And I wanna, if you don't mind, just spell Henry Nowen because it's not quite how you might think. It's H-E-N-R-I and then Nowen is N-O-U. W-E-N. Uh, he was Dutch, wasn't he? That's right. He was. And a lot of people want to call him Henri because it's European, but he called himself Henry. And it was funny because he has the J-M in the middle and they'd ask him, what's that for? And it was just me, you know, just, <laughs> he was very much coming down to kind of like, I'm not exceptional. I'm, this is who I am. And so he would, you know, kind of speak to people on that sort of a level. So Henry, just me now and <laughs> J.M. now and. <laughs> you know, we're talking a book here that was written over 40 years ago, but in it, he describes a generation. I thought this really applies today that no longer believes in anything that is always everywhere, true and valid and creates these people create their own lives on the spot, so to speak. And as a simpler person, uh, I interpreted that as people just live for today and like there's no tomorrow. Would that be a fair analysis of what he was trying to say? Yeah, I, I, I was actually amazed because the original copyright on the book is 1972. So it's 50 years old. And I couldn't get over myself how the, the depths of the currentness of it. 
Now he was speaking to modern man and we might be say, you know, the, the correct verbiage might be postmodern man. I don't know, but it doesn't really matter. As you read this, you really get a feeling uh, of the psychologist that he was. He was both a psychologist and a priest and he had a terrific understanding of, of, uh, who people were. And he wrote the book. The very first line of the book is, he says why he's writing it. And he's, he's basically writing it, um, how to minister to contemporary society. So of course, it was one of the questions I found myself asking, does it still apply? Does it still feel, you know, like the book you should read? Uh, I, I would say it does. I would say it, it really has a tremendous strength, a tremendous understanding of modern man. I'm amazed particularly amongst ministers and people that are, um, you know, in leadership, how many of them have been really influenced by this book, you know, The, the Wounded Healer. And um, there were a couple of books that are kind of all about ministry. One was The Wounded Healer, one was Reaching Out, and one was Creative Ministry. And they tend to be books that people will have in seminary or will have, you know, if they're taking a theological course or something of that nature, This these are substantive and wise but really breaking down who are you who what are the needs of the person you're talking to and then what do i have that i can give to that you know and and that's what henry brings to it you know he talked in the book he of four chapters uh the condition of a suffering world a suffering generation then he talked about um suffering man and then lastly the suffering minister um I think it's fair to say that many people in ministry need healing themselves or have been healed. And because of that fact, they have great empathy and they can become great ministers, but maybe because they have issues or something, you don't feel they're capable, but that's just the opposite, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly what Henry was looking at. Exactly that. It's interesting because he's basically saying that our wounds, uh, we, we, we're not necessarily called to display them, but to to look at them and to bring healing into those. And then in a way we could offer that to others. There's a genuineness. I love the word he uses. It's a very strange one for ministry. He says hospitality. It's basically inviting people into a space where their wounds can be received and can be safe. And I, I think probably, Brian, the truth of the matter is, where we are today, 50 years from where this book was first written, it was probably pretty revolutionary at that point to be bringing psychology and spirituality together. I know it was for the Catholic Church. I'm sure it was. There was a, a vulnerability there of, uh, I'm not quite sure. And, and, and Notre Dame reached out and was the first to you know sort of bring Henry in to be teaching. But I'm sure that there was a kind of vulnerability, um, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, They'd had enough of Freud and they didn't know where, where God fit in the picture. And Henry was so anxious to bring those two together and to, to understand that they, they came together. But this is revolutionary because he's basically saying your woundedness is going to be your strength. That's going to be where you can connect on a very deep level. And, um, and I think the book has that kind of, um, it's profound. And when people read it, it, it also gives them a sense I can do this. I don't have to be different. I need to be real. I need to not live in denial, but I need to be real with what I bring to the table and then be able to bring this sense of strange word, hospitality, a welcoming, a welcoming of people in their pain, but the welcoming into a, a, a space you have within you that's come because you're, you're not denying it. You're, you're able to, to share that. And uh, it's, it's not all about you. He uses a lovely metaphor. I think it's a beautiful uh, rabbinical metaphor about, you know, where's the Messiah? Well, he's at the gate and he's binding his wounds. He's at the gate where the poor are and, the, and, and they're binding their wounds and he's binding his wounds too. And the idea being that he isn't binding them all at once so he can be ready if he's needed. That's the same for anybody who's a minister. Can we bind our wounds one at a time, but be ready to to bring um, the good news to people that need to hear you're not alone and that they are 
that God has something for them. You know, while you were speaking, I was thinking of St. Paul, and, and really what you said was really scriptural. You know, when I am weak, then I am strong. When we recognize that we need God, and Henry had a deep uh, Jesus-centered spirituality from what I read, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, St. Paul talked about, you know, he was given a thorn in the flesh and uh, he prayed three times that the Lord would take it away, but he, he didn't. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And I think all that is exactly a, another way that Henry was saying it. Um, just because you're broken and just because you struggle and are weak or fallen, keep working towards God and spread the good news. I mean, isn't yeah. that a fair assessment? I think it is. I think one of the things that often attracts people to Henry Nouwen's writing is his, his, his honesty. He's so vulnerable and he's so honest. Uh, he's honest about his, his conceits and his failures and his ego and his, you know, the struggles go on and on and on. But he doesn't stop there. But the, the honesty... A lot of people go, oh, that's just like me. And they're, they, feel a, they feel a camaraderie in the, right off the bat with Henry now. And I think they, they find what he's talking about. He's being very real. But then he goes on. And it, you said it. He is so Christocentric. He is so, Christ is so, he's eager to bring you there where you really will find truth. And the deepest truth he can give you is you are really beloved. You really are loved. And Henry unwraps something which a lot of, I, I know I, I kind of love it about him. He unwraps the self-hatred as one of the, the realities of so many people's lives. That inner battle that we have with ourselves that we, we don't think we can be good enough or we're nice enough or we're we have lots of things about ourselves that we we don't like and we are ashamed of and and he he talks about that being the worst enemy i mean he's really it's quite touching it's quite honest it's it you know just it's like as you begin to read a book like this you go oh there is room for me somebody gets who i am and they're not afraid to deny who they are and and yet they are bringing me to the kingdom they're bringing me to god they're bringing me to a fellowship that's healing and has promise for me, my life. Yeah. You know, you talked about we carry these things and, and we're never good enough. So many people relate to those type things because we can be accomplished, but we may be that type of accomplished person that says, oh, I could have done better, would have done better, should have done better. And Henry wrote, didn't he, about if you look at the world, you could lose hope, but yet we have to get back to Christ and be a hope-filled people, and then that conversion can lead to a revolution, he said, of uh, we can change the world. I mean, he, he's a man of hope, wasn't he? He is a man of hope. You're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, he, he, there's this lovely, for lack of a better word, human honesty in him. You know, the book, this book is uh, honest and wise and, and just astonishes me on so many in so many ways but um it is also it also has hope it also isn't it's not and in fact he really acknowledges a kind of hopelessness in modern man he that's one of the things he really identifies is that sense of lostness and hopelessness that sense that they no longer have fathers and that was really meaning that they don't have anything that's a final word anymore it's all kind of up in the air and, and it's up to you to find what's of worth. And so in a sense, as he paints at the beginning of this book, the picture of where people are in the modern age, he then comes around to what, what can we, what do we have to offer? What do we have that can be healing? I loved some of his, one of the things that just uh, blew me away is this quote about no minister can save anyone. We can only offer ourselves as guides to fearful people. Yet paradoxically, it's precisely in the guidance that the first signs of hope become visible. This is so because shared pain is no longer paralysis, but mobilizing. And when it's understood to be a way of, to liberation, when we become aware that we do not have to 
escape our pains, but that we can mobilize them into a common search for life. Those very pains are transformed from experiences of despair into signs of hope. So as you said, there's a hopeful image there. There's a, a, a wonderfully hopeful image. Got all sorts of things marked in here, favorite passages and things like that. <laughs> some of those other passages that you particularly enjoyed. Well, you know, it's something I enjoyed so much in this book. It's funny. Uh, I don't know if I can put my fingers on it right away, but it was actually this business about loneliness and this beautiful metaphor he uses. It's like the Grand Canyon and the beauty in it. But I think what he finds in loneliness that rang true to me was it is profoundly the human condition. You know, it's almost like for myself personally, um, uh, I went through a divorce and uh, and it was the most devastating experience of my life at the time. And I remember distinctly thinking, oh, I'll get through this. You know, I had the busyness of raising a couple of kids and working and whatever, but I kept fearing what happens when I'm older and how will I deal with the loneliness? And um, the reality I love in this book, how profound his unwrapping of loneliness is, how deep that is to the human condition. And once we see that, we no longer feel alone. We realize that is, that's where we connect with everyone in that great sphere. So it, it's interesting to me, as I read this, I, I was reminded of this fear I had and how much uh, God has met me, you know, over the years in that, in that, but yeah, it's quite, quite beautiful. So he writes about loneliness in ways that uh, I hadn't heard anybody else writing about quite like he does. Yeah. There's yeah. lots of, go oh, here, here's the one about loneliness. I love this, this quote. But the more I think about loneliness, the more I think that the wound of loneliness is actually like the Grand Canyon, a deep incision in the surface of our existence that has become an inexhaustible source of beauty and self-understanding. Therefore, I would like to voice loudly and clearly what might seem unpopular and maybe even disturbing. The Christian way of life does not take away our loneliness. It protects and cherishes it as a precious gift. And I think the precious gift in it is the great human understanding that loneliness is the human condition. There is, you know, you can have lots of people in your life, but there's a profound inner part that does only is met in God, but even there experiences great loneliness, great loneliness. And, and God comes to us in that place. He also talked about um, society having a uh, historical dislocation, fragmented <laughs> ideology, and a search for immortality. Uh, not sure I understood all that, but <laughs> when I think of the search for immortality, you know, I, I think of as a physician, People do want, we live in a pharmaceutical, you know, society where there's a, supposed to be a cure quick fix for everything. But uh, because of these problems, uh, many people don't realize we're only here a short time in the spiritual life and, and Christ is beyond and they've lost hope, haven't they? I, I think so. I think it's, it, it was interesting. I'm glad you said that you found some of that stuff is complicated. I read it over several times, kind of going, okay, this is the part where I go, Henry, you're a really brilliant psychologist, and you've really done a great job of analyzing the times we live in. But part of me had to keep reading it, rereading it to kind of go, okay, yes, I see what you're saying. I, I hear what you're saying about modern man. I hear what you're saying about our condition. I would agree uh, with what you said in terms of those early, that's, that's early on in this book. Um, it's, it, there's so many interesting things in there, um, but he challenges that, that lost person to go inward. He challenges them. He's looking for it. He, and he challenges the leaders to go inward too to have a, an, an inward life, an inward, and you kind of go, okay, what's that about? He's really, in a sense, giving the steps to how do I go forward from where I am? Um, I, don't, I don't know 
much more to say about it than that, to be honest. Yeah. You know, it is so true that you've got to go inward, but you don't you have to also go outwards because he talked about we need to kind of care for our own wounds, but then as you mentioned earlier, care for the wounds of others. Uh, yeah. So it's an inward outward uh, thing. That's right. It's an inward outward thing, but we're not to come out and kind of just overwhelm them with our wounds. In essence, we're, we, he's really instructing people, be real, you know, deal with the wounds that you have. That's part of, of your life. Deal with that. Create that space where wounds are not fearful to you, where you have, it's almost like creating space in you to be hospitable to people who are coming and they need to feel safe in that place. Um, our wounds may be very different than the person that we're talking to, but our wounds give us a credibility, but should also give us a, a depth and a, a mercy, you know, a compassion in us. Uh, he speaks of compassion in this, and they should give us a language of compassion that we can uh, embrace people that, that need to be heard, need to share what they are going through in which they feel isolated and alone and really aren't our wounds the the source of may perhaps source isn't right word but a, a an avenue for our own healing but then to help others heal yeah. and when you talk about hospitality i think of two words being present to people yeah. you know because you can talk to people and hear people but there's a I know some people that have the gift of being present. And when you talk to them, you think you're the only person in the universe. You know, that that really being present to people is what he's talking about, isn't he? He is. He really is. Isn't it interesting you'd say that? Because um, I did a documentary on Henry. Um, that's how I came to know him was I was, uh, you know, I, I found Henry through his books. First of all, I was asking people, who are you reading? If somebody inspired me, I wanted to know who they were reading. And I kept hearing the name Henry Nowen. And so I began reading Henry Nowen. And then I was doing a television program at the time. And we were able to interview him and bring him in. And um, I've lost my train of thought there with what, what we were just talking about. Um, hmm, I'm well, trying to think about Being present, perhaps. Yeah, being present. The thing I was going to say is, I went on when Henry died to interview friends and colleagues and family. And one thing everyone said about Henry, when he was talking to you, you were the only person. You just felt his full attention on you, his full, he brought everything to the table. And I think that's a beautiful thing. That was something that he modeled. I also, am, it's going to sound crazy, I'm deeply grateful in a way that he, in a sense, died before computers took over. You know, we don't have a zillion emails, but we have the, this amazing record of letters. And he considered letters part of his ministry. And he wrote to people. There's a book of his letters. Love Henry is, is a compiled of some of the best letters from Henry. But it's only a sampling. If people are interested, they can go into the archives and I think there's something like 5,000 letters wow. those are letters he responded to every single letter he received mm. and we are constantly looking for the letters that are out there we would love them to give them to us so we could put the dialogue together but that sense of being present even to a letter if somebody wrote and said you know I'm having this issue how you know I don't know what to do Henry took time you know he just he really ministered to people I came across something um interesting I I, I Philip Yancey wrote a book called Soul Survivor, and in it, one of the chapters is on Henry Nowen, and, and he tells a, a beautiful story about how there was this young, eager uh, person seeking, you know, spirituality and trying to figure out what he should do, and he had written to Eugene Peterson, and he had written to uh, Richard Foster, and he and, and Philip Yancey, and they were all discussing, you know, what do you do? You know, here you really want to write and you don't want to have too much of your time taken away. So each one of them had written back to this fellow and said, well, here's some books to read. And here's, and then uh, I think it was Eugene Peterson said, you got to, you won't believe what Henry Nowen did. He invited him to come and live at L'Arche for a month. 
and and just he discipled him personally. I mean, uh -huh. and just that sense that he would bring somebody into his world and care for them in that very personal way. Um, you know, there was a giving up of time in that as well, you know, a sacrificing of time. But because writers, you know, you know, if you want to write, you want to write and, right. and you don't want to give up too much time. But having said that, I, I love that story of attention, full attention, it goes back to your words about being present, being fully present, that nothing else is, is matters than the person that's you're with at that moment. And how can I be present to you now? Yeah. He was good friends of the founder of L'Arche, wasn't he? And uh... Of Jean Vanier, yes. Well, what had happened was he had heard of uh, uh, Vanier's work in Trolley, France, and he made a reference to it in his book, um, Clowning in Rome. And it was a positive reference. It, he, you know, he was always interested in what people were doing to really be with the poor, be, be present with needs. And so he had spoken highly of it. And, um, but he never met Jean Vanier and he hadn't been to L'Arche. And out of the blue, this was when he was at Harvard, uh, a woman came from L'Arche bringing greetings from Jean Vanier. And uh, he arrived at her door and at his door and said, I've, I've come to bring greetings from Jean Vanier. And Henry said, well, that's really nice, but I'm in a bit of a hurry. I have to go off to a class. And, but uh, I think he said, you know, if you have no place to go, you can come in. And, and when I get back, we can talk. Well, he comes back and she has set the table and made a meal for him. And there's flowers on the table. And it, it, that was kind of the beginning of a friendship. It was a giving friendship. It was very much, you know, just wanting to thank Henry that he had been so positive. And then later he got a call from Jean Vanier saying, you know, we're having an event in, uh, we're having a, a, a silent retreat in Chicago. And we were just wondering if you'd like to join us. And Henry immediately said, oh, well, listen, I'm really sorry, but I don't have time to give a talk or anything like that. Assuming because everybody was wanting him to speak everywhere. Right. He said, no, no, we're just inviting you to come and be with us and, and have a, you know, a quiet retreat. I think Henry went to that and I think it moved him very deeply. And then when he left Harvard, he deliberately chose to go to France, to Trolley, to L'Arche uh, as part of his uh, sabbatical. Or he, he was really trying to discern, where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do with my life? He knew it wasn't Harvard. He knew that uh, what was happening in the educational, high educational settings was he was not... Um, nurturing his own spiritual life, teaching people how to pray, but he wasn't praying himself. You know, it was just this tension of how do I have this deep life I'm called into? So he literally went, I guess you call it a, a writing sabbatical to live at L'Arche in France. And he was very moved by what he saw, very inspired by what he saw. And then while he was there, it was just a series of events happened that he ended up coming to Canada to do a wedding. And, um, uh, stayed at the large daybreak situation in Canada. And a uh, long story short, they ended up inviting him to come as their pastor. And he had never had a call like that before. He was very moved by it. And uh, for whatever reason, he, he felt like, I think I'm supposed to do this. So he came, he came there. And I mean, when you read in his books, you realize it was not simple. I mean, he really was a person of the head, not of the hands. And the, you know, he, he was quite incompetent in so many ways physically. I mean, he didn't know how to do his own laundry. I mean, he was just that kind of guy that didn't know how to make a meal other than he prided himself on being able to make a special uh, soup, which was a combination of two different kinds of Campbell's soup, you know, that kind of thing. So he wasn't a cook. He wasn't any of these things, but it was a great, great experience for him. And it was a, and for him, um, it, it was a process to come to the place of knowing I'm not known for, these people don't love me or care for me because of what I've written. None of them could read what he'd written. Right. They care for me because I'm here. I'm present. I'm with them and they're present with me. And it was a, it was a profound experience for Henry. It was a safe place. How long was he there? A total of 10 years. He had a, uh, a couple of writing sabbaticals in that. By the time I got to know Henry, which was toward the end of that, very close to, it was probably 95, that I reached out to him and did um, a couple of television programs with him. Um, 
he was getting about 70 invitations a month to speak. He was just, you know, he could go all over the world. He, at that point, was always bringing one of the core members with him because uh, he had come to, to really feel like he was living it. He was showing it. He was, you know, and he said, the truth of the matter is at the end of all of this, you know, whether he was speaking at a prayer breakfast in Washington or wherever, he said, they won't remember a word I said, but they will remember that we stood together side by side. You oh. know, that I stood, stood with somebody who had developmental disabilities and we're friends and we love each other. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Now, Karen, what, what again, give the uh, viewers or listeners the website for the Henry Nowen? Yes, it's, um, it's henrynowen.org. And we offer to everyone the free daily meditation and free podcasts every day on, on our website. So all you have to do is go sign up and then uh, you'll re start receiving them in your emails. And, uh, and they're all writings from Henry Nowen. They, they're from a book called you are the beloved, which is the some of the best quotes from Henry Nowen. And they're they're quite inspiring and beautiful. A good way to sample Henry's writings, because if you read something, you go, oh, I'd like more of that. Then you can find out where that came from. We, we let you know where it came from. And then you can go and, you know, get the book. Henry in his lifetime wrote 39 books. And then there have been books that have been created since then from his writings uh, that were not published at that time so we have there's lots to choose from lots of good riches yeah any closing thoughts here before we wrap up today's show of mercy unbound uh, i love the name of your show mercy unbound what a great name um my thought would be i would just invite people to I, I think a good place to begin if you're if you haven't read an Allen book a good place to begin is to sign up for the daily meditations they're just chunks of beautiful profound thoughtful comments and uh, it's a good way to to get to know who Henry Nowen is and more than any other thing if Henry were here and he were looking at you he would want you to know that you are God's beloved child and no doubt about it, no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And that would be what he'd want to know. The other thing I think which is so lovely about Henry is there was there was a, a, a bigness that included um, Catholics, Protestants, Evangelicals, uh, all ages. Uh, it was not, it was not bound tight and small. It was graciously uh welcoming to all yeah that's what i'd want you to know about henry Absolutely. and i'd love you to come to our website and just it's funny because we're just about to launch a brand new website i think it might be here february 1st um but there's lots of information about henry and you can easily find the books you can find they're based on themes so if you're looking for something on loneliness or on um, you know whatever you're whatever you're hungering for you'll find good material there henry is acknowledged as one of the spiritual masters to emerge from the 20th century. And uh, I'm always amazed as I go out in the podcasts that I do, I reach out to people who are well-known writers today. And I'm always asking, well, did Henry now and ever influence you? And you always find he's been a profound influence in people's lives. He's been a, he's been a place of safety. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant man. Karen, I want to thank you for joining me today on Mercy and Bound. Keep up the great work and uh, thank you. encourage all our viewers to um, go to the Henry Nowen site and uh, let's continue to try to go and grow closer to Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, people don't forget to subscribe to the programs. And uh, Karen, again, thank you. God bless and keep up the great work. Thank you very much, Brian. Thanks for inviting me. This was a treat. Thank you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R, and on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. And for more information, go to the website at drbryanthatcher.com.